All right, Joshua chapter 17. So we're here uh, in Joshua chapter 17, and we're talking about uh, mainly about the inheritance of Manasseh, which we talked about um, Joseph's children last week. But in Joshua chapter 17, um, I'm not going to go through necessarily every single um, verse because a lot of it is describing the borders. I will just kind of explain to you what the borders there um, look like. But look down at verse number 1 of Joshua chapter 17. And let's see what we can find out this evening because there is a kind of a theme at the end of Joshua chapter 17 that I believe um, is important that is uh, very applicable, applicable um, to our lives today. So let's go ahead and look um, at Joshua chapter 17. Look at verse number 1. For there was also a lot for the tribe of Manasseh, for, there was the fir for he was the firstborn of Joseph, to wit, for Maker, the firstborn of Manasseh, the father of Gilead, because he was a man of war. Therefore he had Gilead and Bashan. Bashan. So we're talking about now uh, Manasseh's family tree here in the next couple of verses. And we see something interesting um, in verse number 3, but verse number 2 says, There was also a lot for the rest of, children, of the children of Manasseh by their families, for the children of Abiezer, and the children of Helic, and for the children of Azrael, for the children of... Sechem, and for the children of Hefer, and for the children of Shemida. These were the male children of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, by their family. So these were the male children, just the, just the boys. And then verse number three, we see something a little bit unique. But Zelophanad, the daughter of Hefer, and the son of Gilead, the son of Maker, the son of Manasseh, had no sons but daughters. So keep in mind that, you know, Joseph... Um, the tribe of Joseph, you know, this is several generations down now that we're in the promised land here. Um, so it's the descendants of Joseph that are, uh, that are going to inherit this actual land. And here we see that one of the descendants, the sons of Manasseh, had no sons but daughters. And these are the names of his daughters, Melah and Noah and Hegla, Hogla, Milcah and Terza. So this guy has, um, you know, he's one of these guys, I don't know if you've met these people before, but I, I know a friend one time that, like, you know, they had, there was three brothers in the family, and all three of these brothers just had nothing but daughters. You know, it was like 15 daughters or something like that. Um, and this is the case with um, this man. He just, he didn't have a son, and he had nothing but daughters. And they came, the daughters, came before Eliezer the priest, and before Joshua the son of Nun, and before the prince is saying, the Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance among our brethren. Therefore, according to the commandment of the Lord, he gave them an inheritance among the brethren of their father. So the unique thing that we see here is, you know, a lot in the Bible is said about the boys, you know, the firstborn, the birthright, the, you know, the firstborn gets a double portion in the Bible. So whenever you're seeing the Bible talk about inheritance, the vast majority of the time, it is relating that to, you know, the son or the firstborn son because he is the one that typically carries on the family name or the family um, tree, so to speak. But, you know, we see a lot of that in the Bible. But this is a very unique situation in Joshua chapter 17 and verse number 3 where we see um, a daughter or a daughters of their father getting an inheritance. So we see the daughters, they also receive an inheritance. So we see that, you know, the inheritance is given to them from their father. Now the interesting thing about the daughters in this situation, so I believe that daughters, first of all, it's, it's, it's obviously biblical as we see here for daughters to receive an inheritance. You just don't hear a lot about it in the Bible because there's this real focus on the firstborn and that birthright and the blessing and especially with the lessons that the Bible is showing us with the firstborn many times being rejected as we looked at last week. There's lessons there. There's pictures there as far as nations, individuals. Um, there's pictures of salvation there. But look, the, the daughters receive an inheritance here. That's a biblical thing. Now the interesting thing, um, yeah, I've talked to a couple of you about this specific thing in the last um, couple of weeks, but as I relate um, myself and my goals for my children, we talked a couple of weeks ago about favoritism amongst kids and how you shouldn't have favorites and you shouldn't treat um, you know one child like you love them more than another child and um, things along those lines we see disastrous results from that in the Bible so that's a good lesson for us that we should not do that type of thing so um, the Bible here is showing that daughters receive an inheritance so when I think about this and I think about not having favoritism I think about leaving an inheritance to my daughter um, this is a pretty good model 
right here. As I look at it, it's a pretty good model of you know a father leaving an inheritance to his daughter. And there's some unique things about this inheritance. First of all, these daughters, keep in mind, you know, this wasn't the United States military that was fighting this war. You know, we don't have the women fighting the war for us in the Bible. Okay? But these daughters did not have to fight the battles for this land. These, these sons and, you know, sons, sons, they fought this war. They literally picked up the sword and fought the war. So, as our daughters receive an inheritance, as my daughter receives an inheritance, I said um, a couple of weeks ago that the path to goals may not be look exactly the same for my children, whether they be boys or girls. However, the goals are the same, the path might be different. Meaning, you know, my boys, I'm going to have, you know, goals for my boys, but they're, I'm going to guide them to that goal. They're going to have to fight their way to that goal. As, as the Bible points out here. The monetary solution for the daughters, the, the, you know, for my daughter, will be provided by me, however. So that's kind of um, a biblical look at that. Whereas, you know, the boys, I may guide them. They're going to have to work for things, save for things. I will guide them every step of the way. However, the goal will be the same for my daughter as it is for my boys. However, my daughter is never going to, I'm never going to go and put my daughter outside the home to have a job to save money and all this type of thing. I will provide that for her. I will, her dad will fight that battle for her. But the goal will be the same, if that makes sense. So it's just a really good example of this in the Bible. It's not the main point of the sermon, but number one, the girls receive an inheritance. The girls receive an inheritance. And number two, you know, the boys had to fight the wars. So if anybody in my family could look at, you know, the situation and say, well, the boys, they kind of had to, look, my daughter works too. My daughter works too. It's just she works in the home. She's learning skills in the home. She's, you know, educating herself to be prepared to be a teacher and a mother. And she's preparing in a different way than the boys are preparing. Because, you know, there's just different roles for boys and girls. You know, I hate to break it to you, but that's the way the Bible teaches. So, the goals are the same. However, we see that the girls still get an inheritance, and the boys had to fight the physical battles, which I can see that um, mirrored in the goals and the way that I see my kids, um, the boys and my daughter, getting to those goals. You know, the father will provide that monetary solution for the daughters. Look at Joshua chapter 17 and verse number 5. And then there fell ten portions to Manasseh beside the land of Gilead, and Bashan, which were the other side of Jordan, because the daughters of Manasseh had an inheritance among his sons. See, it is totally biblical for the daughters also to have an inheritance. We just don't see much of it in the Bible because the focus is on this birthright, this blessing. And the rest of Manasseh's sons had the land of Gilead. Now, verse number 7, and all the way down to like verse number 11, is basically describing the borders and the coasts of Manasseh and how it intersects with Ephraim. So if you remember... Um, Ephraim was, he got the blessing um, from um, his father, whereas, you know, from his grandfather, actually, but um, he wasn't the firstborn. Manasseh was the firstborn. So the way the borders lay out is you have Judah, and then you have Benjamin right above Judah, which is a small nation. And then right above that, you have the nation of Ephraim. And, then right, and that is the line, by the way, of the northern kingdom. So everything Ephraim and north is the northern kingdom as we read through the Bible. But above Ephraim, separated by this river that we learn about in Joshua chapter 17, is the tribe of Manasseh, above Ephraim. And of course, Manasseh, they had land on both sides of the Jordan River, okay? They, because they decided that they would settle some land before they even came across. But they still did the right thing. They helped them fight for the land. Um, on the other side of the river. And we've gone through that story. But the main point that I want to get at this evening, and this isn't a long chapter, but there's a, there's a big theme we see starting in verse number 12 of this chapter. Look at the verse number 12 of Joshua chapter 17. It said, Yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. Yet it came to pass when the children of Israel were wax and strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute, but they did not utterly drive them out. So basically, 
put them to tribute, they let them live there, and they let them live like in subjection to them, and they taxed them, and they worked for them, and they were in servitude um, to the, the children of Manasseh. But they, they lived among them, is, is the issue. They did not utterly drive them out. Look at verse 14. And the children of Joseph spake unto Joshua, saying, Why hast thou given me but one lot of one portion to inherit, seeing I am a great people, for as much as the Lord hath blessed me hitherto? And they're like, hey, we're supposed to have more land than this. And Joshua answered them, If thou be a great people, then get thee up to the wood country, and cut down for thyself there in the land of the Perizzites and of the giants, if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. And the children of Joseph said, so this is, this is Manasseh and Ephraim, the children of Joseph, said, the hill is not enough for us. And all the Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron, both they who are, the, who are of Beth Sheen and her towns, and they who are of the valley of Jezreel. They're saying, look, like, the hill's not enough for us, we need more land. It's like everywhere around this hill and everywhere where we need more land on our borders, are these people that have all these, you know, strong armies. They have chariots, they have cavalries, both they, are, you know, they're talking about chariots of iron, meaning they have strong armies. They have strong defenses. Look at verse 17. Look at verse 17. And Joshua spake unto the house of Joseph, even to Ephraim and to Manasseh, again, both of the tribes, saying, Thou art a great people, and hast great power. Thou shalt not have one lot only. He's saying, look, you're not supposed to just have one lot. Look at, he said, look at verse 18. But the mountain shall be thine, for it is wood, and thou shalt cut it down, and the outgoings of it shall be thine, for thou shalt drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots, and though they be strong. So the last half of this chapter is kind of this back and forth between Joshua and Ephraim and Manasseh, basically these, these two tribes and all their descendants. So it's really, it's not like one person. It's, it's all these descendants of these tribes. Joshua is, is telling them, look, you have to drive these people out. And then these people come back and they say, we can't, they're too strong. It's like, we can't do it. They're too strong for us. Why don't we have more land? I mean, they're kind of, it kind of seems like they're pouting a little bit, that they don't have enough land, yet Joshua's telling them how to get more land. He says, this is your land, and they're saying, no, they're too strong for us. So the point I want to make this evening is we see, look, these people have fought a war. These people have fought many battles. We read about these battles already um, throughout the beginning of Joshua. What we're going to talk about this evening is this idea of losing the will to fight. It seems that they just, they've lost the will to fight. Why? Look, look at verse 16 again. Like I said, it says back and forth. Joshua, you're strong. No, we're not. You're strong. No, we're not. Look at verse 16. Look, the, the issue here, look, folks, the issue here was not that they lost. It's not that they were beaten. Look at verse 16. And the children of Joseph said, the hill is not enough for us. They said, we don't have enough land. We have a problem. And all the Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron, both they of who are of Beth Sheen and her towns and they who are of Jezreel. First, uh, I mean, look, why do people lose the will to fight is the points that I want to look at this evening. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 3. I'm going to give you three reasons tonight why people, and relate it to um, the people in this chapter, why people don't fight the battles that they should. Joseph is, Joseph, or Joshua, I'm sorry, Joshua is saying to these people, look, you should go fight this battle. You are strong. He's like, he's almost like a coach, like trying to just like get them just excited. You, know, like, you are strong. They're like, they're strong. But you're stronger, Joshua is saying. So the first thing, the first thing I want to look at this evening, look at Deuteronomy chapter 3. Deuteronomy chapter 3. The first reason that people lose the will to fight, because these people used to fight. In this particular case, they fought many, many battles, and just they, it seems like they were just done fighting at this point. They didn't want to fight anymore. The first reason is this, is they have a fear of losing. They have a fear of losing. These people in Joshua chapter 17, the children of Ephraim, the children of Manasseh, they had a deep fear of losing. They thought that they couldn't win. Thus, they did not want to go and fight. They thought that they couldn't win. So look, folks, the first, if you have battles in your life that you think you can't win. The first step is this. The first step even 
aside from any of the three things that we're going to talk about this evening is you need to identify if it's something that the Lord wants you to do. You need to personally identify. You're saying, I have some battles coming up in my life, and I don't know, I'm scared for just whatever reason. We'll talk about one of the reasons that I guarantee we'll put the finger on one of your reasons here this evening. The first one that we see in Joshua chapter 17 was they had a fear of losing. But the first thing that everyone needs to look at, and these people should have looked at, was, is this a battle that the Lord wants me to fight? That's the, that's the only question that we really need to answer for ourselves. Look, it, really it's this, three words. Is it just? Is it a just battle? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 3. Look at verse 22. Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse number 22. I could go to dozens and dozens of verses that show you that that answer was very clear for the children of Israel. was very clear for Manasseh and Ephraim. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 22, Ye shall not fear them. For the Lord your God, He shall fight for you. Look, they should have known they would win. They should have known that they would win the physical battle. So it was an easy one for the children of Israel. I mean, the Lord literally told them over and over and over again to drive these people out. To utterly destroy them. I mean, so that was, that was an easy one. Do, do we fight this battle? They knew that they were supposed to fight that battle. So look, once we identify, once we personally identify the just battles in our lives, all we have to do is just have faith that the Lord will fight for us, just like Deuteronomy 3.22 says. Look, if we, we identify a battle in our lives that's not a just battle, and then, you know, we could find ourselves in trouble there. If we find something in our lives like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, you know, this is the battle of, you know, I'm not going to pay my income tax or whatever. You know, look, that's very specifically called out by Jesus that that's not something you should fight. That's not a battle that you should fight. Just give them the money, Jesus said. But look, just after we identify the just battles in our lives, just have faith that the Lord will fight for us. That's all we need to do. And look, folks, many times uh, uh, a worldly loss to us will just be you know, a bigger and better direction that God wants you to go in your life. You just don't see it. Look, this is the whole story. This is the whole story with unanswered prayers. I mean, how many of you hey, can look back five years ago, two years ago, three years ago, and have a prayer that wasn't answered? But now you can look back on that prayer and you can say, oh yeah, I know what God was doing there. I mean, I have many of those situations where you're just like, because I'm, look, I, I'm terrible at this. I'm terrible at this. I think, look, I'm getting better as I get older, I think, and as I mature. But look, many times you figure out a plan in your life and you say, you know what? This is how I'm going to do this thing. And according to the, and it may be right according to the Bible. There may be nothing wrong with your plan according to the Bible. But look, that plan just may not work out. Turn to Isaiah chapter 55. And you sit there and you say, what in the world? Why didn't God answer that prayer? Why didn't that plan work out? What's going on? But here's the thing. We cannot see God's plan. We cannot see God's plan before it happens. Look at Isaiah chapter 55 and verse number 8. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse number 8. Look, many times we have a plan. I get it. And our plan may not be, you know, unbiblical. But look, God's plan may not match our plan. And we have to understand that. As a matter of fact, there's been many times in my life where God's plan did not match my plan. Look at Isaiah 55 and verse 8. The Bible says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are, look at this one, neither are your ways my ways. You know what that means? That means that your plans are not my plans. Look, you may have great intentions, and it may be even, you know, right according to the Bible, but God may have a higher way. God may have a better way, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Look, I'm glad for this then. Because not only does, does my plan not necessarily have to match up with God's plan all the time, but as long as I'm fighting, don't miss this, as long as we're fighting the just battles, as long as we've identified that, that first question, is this just? Is this moral? 
Is this something I should be fighting? As long as we get that one right, even if God takes it on his plan, it's better than our plan. It's higher. It's higher. It's better. So I'm thankful. As long as I can look back and say, you know what? I was supposed to do that. that there's no way that that was the wrong decision to do that because I did it for the Lord and I stood up for that. And then just the plan takes a turn that I'm not really, just, I just have faith. It's like, look, I know that that was the right battle to fight and God's got me on a different plan, but his plan's better than mine, so I'm just going to have faith in that. Amen. That's it. That's all you have to do. It's the key, the trick, is that first question. Is it a just battle? Is it something you should be fighting? But look, here's the thing, folks. We're not going to understand God's ways all the time. Why? Because we're dumb? No, because they're higher than our ways. Amen. They're better. They're higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. That means we're not going to get it all the time. We're not going to understand it. But you know when you really can understand it is when you look back on it then you can really see it. Because why? Why can you look back on it and see it? Because you can see the results of it. Because you can see that, oh yeah, that was a way better plan. That was a much better way than the way I was going. So look, all we have to do, folks, all we have to do is fight the fights and not fear losing. That's the first point. We have to not fear losing. Because even if we think that it's not working out, you know, maybe, you know, there will be a time where we're like, you know what, maybe I shouldn't have fought there. <laughs> you know, just remember this. His way is better. His way is better. As long as we're fighting the right fights, everything will work out. The only thing that throws off his plan is if we fight the wrong battles or we, we, we see the right battles and we don't fight them. Those two things. And many people know what right battles are but they choose not to fight because they're afraid of losing. Just like the, ch the children of Manasseh and Ephraim in Joshua chapter 17. What next? So the fear of losing. We don't have to fear losing. Don't fear losing. Just make sure you're fighting the right battles. Choose the right battles. Fight them. Fear no loss. God will take care of the rest. His plan is better than your plan, even if you don't understand it at the time. You'll be able to look back on the results, and you will understand it. I promise you. Just make sure you're fighting the right battles. What next? Why do people lose the will to fight? That's the first reason, because they're, they're, they're afraid of losing. What's the next one? Here's the next one. Fear of the fight itself. Fear of the fight itself. Look, some people have a fear of fighting. You say, what do you mean? Like physically fighting, you know, all this. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I used to always get like really, I, I was always, almost every time, even if I knew it was going to be a really easy match, I was always nervous before a wrestling match. Always. Like super nervous. But the thing is, like once it started and you got like hit in the head the first time, like at that first contact, all the nervousness just goes away. Like you were, I was never nervous ever one time while I was wrestling a wrestling match. Ever. But before, you know, just that, just that fear of the, just that nervousness of the confrontation itself, it's nerve-wracking. Here's the thing, that's just an analogy of a physical fight, but here's the thing. Fear of fighting can set in when we get too comfortable in our lives. We get too comfortable. I mean, look, a lot of people, you know, we get so comfortable in our lives, especially as Americans, we get so comfortable in our lives that a lot of people will just, they'll, they'll get, they'll just do anything to stay comfortable. And that's fear of fighting. That's no good. Look, I like to be comfortable. Don't get me wrong. I enjoy, I enjoy, you know, having a job. I enjoy, you know, having a, a life that's not full of turmoil and, and stress and all these things. But here's the thing. If there's a fight, that steps in front of me that is a just fight to fight, I cannot not fight that fight because I want to hang on to my comfort. Amen. I cannot fear that fight because I may lose some comfort. So you always have to keep that in mind when you get comfortable. When you get comfortable in your life, you always have to kind of remember like, you know, I'm thankful that I'm comfortable right now. 
I'm thankful that God is blessing me, that I'm in a comfortable position right now, but if there's a fight that I need to fight that is a just battle, and that costs me this comfort, I will fight that for the Lord. You always have to keep that mindset. It's kind of, you know, it's a difficult thing to do, especially, you know, when, when you're comfortable. But the thing is, turn to Revelation, turn to Revelation chapter 21. Look, if you're nervous and don't want to get into a battle, all you have to do is just jump right into it. That's because then the anticipation of it is the worst, just like I was saying. Just get right into this Christian life, folks. Just rip the Band-Aid off. Then it's great. You know, so many people are nervous about the battle. Nervous about, you know, fighting any battle. About committing to any, you know, fight in their Christian life. But the thing is, you just have to do it. And then it, that, that goes away. That fear goes away. You know, I mean, you're constantly sitting there, you know, is this going to work out? You know, it, it, look, if it's the just battle, that's all that matters. That's all you have to tell yourself. Is this the just battle? battle. Look at Revelation chapter 21. You know what you call like, I mean there's a word for that, like fear of fighting. You know, somebody that doesn't want to go into the battle because they're afraid. That's like, you know, that's called cowardice. You know, we're not supposed to be afraid of anything except the Lord. Look at Revelation chapter 21, 8. How many times have you read this verse? Don't forget the first three words of this verse. Talking about terrible sins. This is a good verse to just give to people an example of terrible sins, you know, sins that people have done, and then, you know, of course, it throws in liars, which were all for sure liars. But look at verse number 8. I think this one probably applies to most people as well. Verse number 8, the first three words says, But the fearful, look, being afraid to fight for just things, to fight the Christian fight, is a sin. It's listed with these terrible sins. It's listed with unbelieving, abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters. Look, being fearful is a terrible sin. And the reason, look, the reason, folks, that it is listed with all these terrible sins is because being fearful can ruin your life. Not wanting to fight the battles, seeing just battles in front of you, seeing these battles like, yes, I know that this is wrong, and I know I should fight this battle, and saying, but I'm afraid. But I'm afraid to go into that because of what it may cost me, because of my comfort, because I'm afraid to fight. That, that's a terrible sin right there. So look, turn to Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24. Look what Joshua said. Joshua chapter 24. Look, the only thing that we have to fear, the only thing that we should fear is the Lord. And there's just verse after verse after verse in the Bible about that. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 14. The Bible says this, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and truth. Look, all we have to fear is the Lord. Anything more than that is, is a terrible sin that's going to lead us down a terrible road in our lives. What's the third reason? So we see that people are afraid to lose, number one. Number two, people are afraid to fight in general. Look, all we have to do to solve number one and number two is just identify, is, is this a fight that, it, look, this is an easy one too. Because I believe that most of these situations, they're not gray in our lives. We know the battles that we should fight in our lives. Look at Joshua, I'm sorry, look at the third reason. The third reason is this, people just get tired of fighting. Turn to Galatians chapter 6. That was probably part of the case with Manasseh because these people used to be fighting. These people were fighting great battles at the beginning of Joshua and then they just, they just didn't, you kind of see this trend which is really kind of pops out in this chapter that they just don't really want to fight anymore. They don't seem to have that confidence anymore. They're just kind of tired of fighting. Look, people get tired of fighting. You'll see this in the Christian life as well. Look at Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, look at verse number 9. Look what the Bible says. It says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season... We shall reap if we faint not. Notice what it says here. It says you're going to get weary, but you're going to get weary what? 
You're going to get weary. Here, here's the trick to this whole thing. You're weary in well-doing. So these people, these people that are, that are getting weary in Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 9, they're doing well at the time that they get weary. They're getting weary in well-doing. That's the trick to getting weary. Because guess what? You are all going to get weary. You are all going to get weary in your life. But the trick to getting weary is this. You need to be doing well when you get weary. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. At the time when weariness hits, you need to be separated. At the time when weariness hits, you need to have your kids already out of the school system. At the time when weariness hits, you need to be in a good church. At the time when weariness hits. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Look, look you don't want to be, you don't want to be, you're all going to get weary. And you don't want to get weary when you don't have things squared away in your life. You don't want to get weary when you're not doing well. If you get weary when you're not doing well, there's going to be a lot of trouble in your life. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. That's the main context of the next few verses, that we should live together with him. We should be living together for Christ. We should be living for Christ in our lives. Wherefore, comfort yourselves. Once again, what does it say? Together. And edify one another, even also, even, even as also, ye what? Ye do. What does that mean? Even as also ye do. Even as you're living for Christ. As you're doing this, you need to be comforting one another. You need to be edifying one another as you are doing this. Look at verse 12. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. So, verse 13. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's, work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Look, what this is saying in these few verses is have good relationships in the church. And a lot of people um, teach verse 12 and verse 13 as far as you know, how to treat your pastor and things like that. But I want to point out that there is two groups here. There's two groups here. It's not just the pastor. It's those that labor among you. It's those that labor among you. Look at verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient towards all men. Look, when you get weary, you don't want to be by yourself. When you get weary, you want to be in a safe place. See, here's the problem. Here's the problem with the Christian life. The Christian life, you're, you're, you're in this Christian life, and you're going to get weary, and you're going to get tired, and you're going to get down in this Christian life. There's going to be valleys in your Christian life. I hate to break it to you. There's going to be valleys in your Christian life. And guess what? You don't want to be... Like, here's the problem. As, as your Christian life has valleys... Look, and you should have as few valleys as possible. The Bible says you're going you're to get weary. But the world, the prince of this world, is putting constant pressure. So as you get weary, that pressure doesn't go away. As you have these valleys, and you're in a valley, there's still the pressures from the world. There's still the temptations from the world. And you're in a valley. You're like, oh man, well, what am I supposed to do that? Well, you're supposed to not be by yourself. That's what you're supposed to do. That, that's what, that's what this, this verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, these verses, that's what they're telling you. That you need to be together. You need to be squared away. You need to be in the right place in your Christian life because when you hit those valleys, then you know, you, that pressure won't overcome you is what the Bible is saying. You know, this is the problem with people that think they don't need a church. They're crazy. I mean, they're nuts. I mean, imagine, I was thinking about this out soul winning today. We went out soul winning in a neighborhood today, and it was freak town. I'm telling you, Freakville, big time. I mean, everybody, it was just freaks everywhere. The girls came to us, and they're like, hey, man, we ran a bunch of freaks. And I'm like, yeah, we met freaks over here, too. There's freaks everywhere. I mean, it was, it was zombie land. Everybody's doing drugs everywhere. And, you know, the, the girls ran into some weirdos, and we ran into some weirdos. And it's just like, it was just one of those neighborhoods. And you know what? You know what, though? We're walking down the street, 
And, you know, we're driving back in the car, and we're, we're going back into the church after soul winning, and, you know, we're just chuckling about it. We're just chuckling about it. We're like, yeah, you know, nobody was interested in the gospel, and there's all these, you know, weirdos and, you know, you know per perverts, people saying vulgar things and all this, and it's just like, you know, we're just kind of like, yeah, that, that was crazy. You know, we're kind of chuckling it and just kind of letting it, like, slide off our, you know, like water off a duck's back. But guess what? Now imagine, now imagine that you're in that neighborhood and you're soul winning by yourself. Imagine what that would do to you. Just picture that for a second. Everybody that went soul winning today, just picture that you were just soul winning, carrying a Bible in that neighborhood today by yourself. That, that would be depressing. You would walk away and you'd be like, I mean, I can see Brother Johannes' face. He's like, I would never want to go soul winning again. He's just, his face is like, <laughs> look, it's, it's, it's no good. Look, Satan, Satan is relentless, folks. There's constant pressure. You cannot, you must be in the right place with the right people or it's not going to work. Because you're going to get weary and you're going to get worn down and you're going to run in to, you know, weirdos out there. I mean, soul winning is a perfect example of this. That's why, you know, the people that are like, I don't need a church. I'm just going to go soul winning on my own. It's like, yeah, good luck. You're not going to do that long. You know, it, it, look, you're gonna, you don't want to be some wounded fawn all alone in the middle of a meadow. You know, instead, you want to be strong. You want to be in a strong group of people. And then when verse 14 kicks in, you know, it's comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, and, you know, that's why you're in church, folks. That's why you're part of a church, surrounded by the brethren. So when you have those moments, when you have those moments, you're not alone. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. I mean, think about, think about your kids. Think about your kids when your kids get weak. Oh, wait a minute. Your kids are weak. The very nature of children is they're weak. That's why the Bible says that they need to be protected, that they need to be taught, that they need to be kept safe, that they need to be trained. The Bible never talks about taking your kids and just like throwing them out to be, you know, let's send our kids into that neighborhood to go soul winning. You know, I mean, no, it's talking about, you know, training and protecting and pro teaching and keeping safe when it comes to kids. They're in a safe environment. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says here, it says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. Guess what? Guess what? If you're in a peak, or if you're in a valley, the odds are that your brethren are not. Because everyone's lives kind of go like this. Beep. You know, hopefully if, you're, if we're a strong church, our lives kind of go like this. Boop. Boop. Hopefully our lives aren't like you know, we don't, we're not like flatline Christians, right? If we're all flatline Christians, this wouldn't work. But the idea is that when you have a little, you know, a little bump, a little meadow, a little valley, that everybody else is, is high. So one can lift up the other. That's the idea, folks. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. That's why you have to be a strong church. We can't all just be laying on the ground like turtles on our back, right? That wouldn't work. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth. For he hath not another to help him up. That's, hi that's him that's trying to go this thing alone. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. This was soul winning today, right here, this verse. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Yeah, it was a messed up neighborhood. I mean, it's, it's, it's rare that you see so many messed up people living in the same block. I mean, sometimes you, you run into them here and there, but look, because that we were all together and we were a threefold cord, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like no big deal. You know, it's no big deal. It's, it's a conversational piece. You know, that's all it is. So look, we can't be afraid of losing. We can't be afraid of fighting, and we just have to kind of know that we're gonna get weary. So don't get depressed if you get weary. Just you need to make sure that you're in the right place. 
You need to make sure that you're going through the right motions in your Christian life. You need to make sure that you're separated, you're in a church, you're homeschooling, you've got everything squared away. And then when you get weary, it's no big deal. We'll just pick you up, we'll just hold you up until you're not weary anymore, and then you're off to the races once again. That's how that goes. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So in conclusion, here's what you really need to know. Here's what you really need to know as you think about battles that might be coming up in your life. Battles you're like, I know that there's some battles coming up in my life. They're just battles. I know I should fight them. Here's all you need to know. You eventually, eventually, we will have the victory. That's all we need to know. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse, um, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look at verse number 57. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look at verse number 57. Look what the Bible says. It says, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Look, we win in the end. Even throughout the horrible story of everything happening in Revelation to the Christians, we win in the end. We win in the end. So even when it feels like maybe you're not winning, just remember that. There will be, bat look, there will be battles in your life that you feel like you're, you're losing or you feel like you lost. That's normal. That's normal. There will be battles in your life where you feel like, you know, that didn't go well. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. But the beauty of that is this. The beauty of, of fighting a battle, like, as long as, like, again, it was a battle that I was supposed to fight. I went and I fought it. And it looks like I'm laying down on the ground bleeding. It looks like that did not go well for me. Look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 12. Look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 12. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 12. The Bible says, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets were, which were before you. Look, the more battles... Here's, here's how it works. The more battles you fight on earth and lose on earth, the better your eternity will be. I mean, think about that. I mean... You are just, if you're fighting battles and you just, I mean, as long as they're just battles, if you're fighting them, it doesn't even matter if you win or lose, like the, the earthly battle, because you're just racking up rewards in heaven. And look, I don't think a lot about rewards, to be honest with you. I don't think a lot about rewards. I mean, the Bible talks a lot about rewards in heaven. I don't think about it that much because honestly, I'm just happy to be saved. I'm happy to not be going to hell. I'm thankful that I got saved. I kind of feel like I slid into to home on that one. I kind of feel like I just beat the throw. You, ever, you know, you ever have that feeling? Yep. But look, I mean, here's the thing. I don't think about rewards that much, but in this context, it's okay to think about rewards. That you know what, if I'm going to fight a battle and I'm losing, at least, you know, at least there will be a reward in heaven for that. At least I won that battle in heaven. Turn to James chapter 1. Even more specifically, on this, on this specific thing, this fighting these types of battles and losing them on earth, the Bible even gives us a specific reward that we're going to get for this. Look at James chapter 1 and verse number 12. James chapter 1 and verse number 12. And then we're going to go to Revelation chapter 2. James chapter 1 and verse number 12, the Bible says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Look, how do we show, how do we show um, that we love the Lord? Think about this statement right here. How do we show that we love the Lord? You know, if you love me, keep my commandments. Look, we show that we love the Lord through our actions. We show that we love the Lord. Look, thank God. Look, thank God that God is all about action. And he's not just words. Oh, I love you, God. That's us, right? Oh, I love you. You know, and then we do no action. That, that's us. Thank God God doesn't have the same definition of love as we do. But the Bible says here, it said, if you really love God, meaning you take action in your life towards God, and you fight those battles, the Lord's going to give you a crown of life. I don't know what that looks like. You know, it's probably pretty good. Look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 10. Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 10. So we're going to get this crown of life. For those that love God, those that show action, love is action. That is God's definition of love, is action. Look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 10. 
God didn't just say that he was going to send his son to pay for our sins so we could be saved through a free gift of believing in him. He didn't just say that. He did it. He took the action. Revelation 2.10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Underline thou shalt suffer. Because that kind of means, that kind of, I, when I read that, that thou shalt suffer, it kind of makes me think that I'm losing some battles right there. If I'm, you know, if I'm, fear none of those things that thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. That probably felt like a loss at that point. When those people, or when these people, they take a stand, they're like, you know what? I'm not putting up with this. I'm taking a stand on this, and they're cast into prison. I bet that feels like a loss at that point. I hope not, because it's not. As long as it's a just battle, it's a win. That ye may be tried. That ye shall have tribulation ten days, and be thou faithful unto death. You know, when the guillotine's coming down on your head, some people might think, oh man, that didn't go well. Not me, man. Not me. When that guillotine is coming down, I'm going to be like, W! Crown of life, here it comes. And I will give thee a crown of life. Look, you got to assume that you're going to lose some battles uh, on, on the earth as far as like what we might look at as a win. But here's the thing, we win in the end. We win in the end. The more you... The more you lose here, for this tiny little speck of time that is our life, the more we win all the way to eternity. You get to wear that crown for eternity. Folks, look, it's worth all these battles. All these battles are worth the fight, is what I'm trying to get at this evening. We're going to get tired of fighting. We're going to be afraid to fight. All these things are normal. We see it in the Bible in Joshua chapter 17. But every single battle that is just is worth fighting. And no matter what happens, you know, that's the thing. That's the thing. Most battles like, that we would think of, this is the problem. Most battles we would think of like from a secular, logical mind, like we're going to go and I'm going to fight this guy right here. You know, and then he just beats me into the ground. I'm going to, you know, that's a loss, right? But here's the thing. With the Christian battles, just the fact that we stand up and we fight the battle is a win. We can't lose. The only way we can lose is if we're afraid and we don't fight it in the first place. That's the only way we can lose. Fight as hard as you can. I mean, this is it. This is it. Fight as hard as you can in this tiny little temporal moment that you have in your life. That's what we can... And, and if we do that, there's no way we can lose. No matter what you think or what you think it looks like, if you fight it and it's worth fighting and it's a just fight, it's a win. Jesus promises us that. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for...